desire, aspiration, achievement, impact. These are all things that one wants to do when they're young, as they look out and try and figure out what they're going to be when they grow up. For me, when I was growing up, I'm going to now share something because I understand from TED Talks you're supposed to share a little bit about yourself that maybe you haven't revealed before. But my true ambition was ever since I was small. Originally, it was a fireman. I gave that up. <laughs> and now, or then, it became to be an eccentric philanthropist. Now, how do you become an eccentric philanthropist? Why did I decide? Well, what I realized is anybody when I was young who was called crazy typically didn't have any resources. And everybody who had resources and did something crazy was called eccentric. So I realized if I'm eccentric, it means I have resources. And if I'm a philanthropist, it means I care about the world. And I probably will be old and gray, but at least I will have lived an interesting life. So to be an eccentric philanthropist means that it's a long life journey to get there. So today I want to talk to you about my path path and journey to become an eccentric philanthropist. I'm not there yet. Uh, my old uh, Harvard Business School professor, um, I don't know if I should call him old, but it's, it's Professor Solomon, when all the students used to come to him and ask, what should I be when I graduate Harvard Business School, because uh, they have such great opportunities, he would show a slide like this. There's a job for everyone. <laughs> And what it taught me very clearly was you don't take yourself seriously, you take your ambition seriously, you take your goal, your objective seriously. Take it to the button, not the heart, as my wife would say. So for me, becoming a centric philanthropist, where do I start? Of course, something you love, pixie sticks. I went to camp when I was young, and sure enough, my parents who never spoiled me any other time, for some reason, when I went away to camp, I guess they were so happy to get rid of all the kids for a while, they brought on visiting day, tons of candy, and in particular, my favorite, pixie sticks. Well, I had a problem because all the kids would see that I had pixie sticks and want them, and I had no way to, fit, to share with them, and I felt terrible. Guilt, angst, it was terrible, pressure. So I decided I would sell them, because I figured whoever wants the most would pay the most. So I didn't do it out of profit motive, but I ended up making a lot of money each summer, and I ended up with my first business of selling pixie sticks. I then moved on to beads. It turns out that my oldest brother wanted to make money. So he decided to have a, a slave labor, meaning my sisters and myself, make beaded jewelry and sell it. My sister Susan was very good at create creativity. So she innovated all kinds of designs and everything else. And my other sister was very good at operations and making sure the factory continued to work. We sold beads. It was very beautiful, it did great. But again, I wasn't in it for the money. I was in it to finally hang out with my older brothers and sisters. So finally, what business could I ever start that would be mine? And I realized it had to do with pencils. When I was in middle school, there was a game that people would play. It would be called uh, pencil fighting. And basically what would happen is one person would flip the pencil against another pencil, then the other person's turn until one pencil broke. And when it broke, guess what? You needed another pencil. And I realized you had a captive market at school because they keep breaking pencils, but there's no store to buy more. So I went and I, took, I bought pencils, and when they would break their pencil, I'd say, here's another one, 25 cents. And what I realized after that is I got colored pencils, they liked it better. And then I realized if I got lead three instead of lead two, you actually could flex the pencil better and you'd have more torque. And so those people would win. So I understood all this about business. But what I really learned about business is that you have to have a mission. My mission at the beginning was to share, hang out with my family, maybe make profit. You had to have innovation. My sister was able to innovate on the bead business. I was able to innovate on the pencil business. And you have to identify markets. But the biggest issue was you have to be sustainable. At the end of the day, no business makes it or lasts if it's not sustainable. People all know BlackBerry, which everybody questions each week, is it going to survive or not? But at one point was a dominant phone, and now it's the iPhone. That's an easy one. So how do we graduate from from there. So when I became, wanted to be an eccentric philanthropist and I understood these things, I had to apply it. Well, the best way to do it was to go get an education. And I, of course, went to law school because if you want to make social change, you need to know and be a lawyer and, and how the, the, the rules work. I went to law school, first week of law school, true story, they put you in a room with all your classmates, you sign uh, a survey of everything you want to do in life. And then three days later, at the end of orientation, they read it back to you. So as they're reading it back, the one question that 
that stood out in my mind is they said, we asked everybody what you want to do when you graduate law school. 87% of you said you want to work in the social sector or for government and give back to society. And I'm one of the guys going, of course that's what I'm going to do. Then they said, we also gave a survey to the third year uh, people who now have accepted jobs. 4% of you will end up going to the social sector or government sector. And I said, well, that might be true for the other 83%, but I'll be in the 4%. What they didn't tell me is that what happens third year when you're trying to figure out what you're going to do for a living, they give you your loans, your student loan packet and show you all the bills you have to pay back. <laughs> and I quickly realized the government job that I really wanted to do, which I had actually applied for and got, was not my, my future. And I took a big law firm job and realized I was going to have to find a different path to be an eccentric philanthropist. So my next path was, well, I'll be an entrepreneur and I will form a nonprofit on the side while I was a lawyer full time. And what I formed was called the Modern Educational Technology Center. Here's how brilliant I was in business. In 1994, when companies like Amazon were getting started, Yahoo, you might have heard of these, um, I realized that the internet was coming, and me and my friend Rick Lane decided that we would form a nonprofit. <laughs> Because what we realized was that the educational system in the state of Maryland at the time was ill-prepared for technology. They actually had their budgets that in, for technology against their physical plan. So you literally went to a meeting and they were debating, should we buy, buy a new roof for our high school or should we buy a computer? Well, that was never going to be a win for the computers. It was always going to be a win for the rooftops. So at the end of the day, what ended up happening was they, they, they always made the wrong decision. So we formed a nonprofit. We got the PTA, the county council, the teachers union, Discovery Communications, Texas Instruments, a number of other companies all sitting around the same table trying to figure out how we put technology in education. We ended up testifying in Congress uh, on, on the first law in the United States. It was uh, Kennedy's uh, Ted Kennedy's bill uh, to fund technology for education nationally. We wrote a bill and got it passed in the state of Maryland legislature. And we also got IBM to donate a full computer lab to the high school. So we went to the superintendent with this. We said, Mr. Superintendent, we have a great thing. We have a whole computer lab free of charge. Just tell us which high school you wanted. And to our great surprise, and I'll never forget the moment, he said to, um, to, to me and Rick, he said, just because you're offering it doesn't mean I need to take it. We couldn't figure it out. We ended up putting it in the PTA, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the teachers union offices, and they ended up teaching uh, teachers how to uh, teach technology in the classroom. So we went around them. We accomplished great things, and we ultimately wound down the um, we wound, wound down the nonprofit because we learned one big thing about nonprofits: they're hard to sustain. At the end of the day, you need to always get more money because you don't make any money, and you always have to have a mission and people who believe in it consistently. And so to maintain that takes a lot of lot of effort. And so I realized that just pure nonprofit probably is not the best way to do philanthropy. Now at the same time, I was also working in that big law firm and I was fortunate enough to work on something called the Enterprise Funds. Go back in history now, some of you in the audience I can see weren't born yet. But in 1989, what happened? In November, the wall came down, the Berlin Wall. Freedom came to Eastern Europe, millions of people. Here's the problem. The United States was in a recession and you couldn't give foreign aid to new governments that were popping up because there literally wasn't a banking system to take the money. So the United States did something very interesting. They passed a piece of legislation that created effectively venture capital funds with the U.S. government funds, and they, they uh, it had private sector people sit on the boards and hire people to invest in order to have a, what we called a bubble-up economy. So we, it, we made investments in banking industry, manufacturing industry, printing industry, schools, training, everything. Bottom line, what started with $60 million ended up being a $1.2 billion government program. And instead of only two countries where it started, it ultimately went to 10 different countries. And over the last 20 years, created 300,000 jobs and attracted over $6.9 billion more. Now that's truly public-private partnership. That was huge impact. In fact, and I'm not supposed to read, I know for these things, but in 2013, after all those years, the, the Agency of International Development did a whole study and concluded 
concluded the enterprise funds are one of the very few development programs to achieve sustainable economic development impacts while leveraging additional investment resources, generating substantial program income to endow long-term host country legacy foundations, and ultimately returning a significant portion of their original grant funds to the U.S. taxpayers. This differentiates the enterprise funds from all other traditional aid programs. Basically, the program took $1.2 billion and returned over $1.7 billion. What other, what other government program ever did that? So of course, they repeated it often, right? It hasn't been done in the last 20 years. So what did I learn from that? One is the reach of a public-private partnership and the scale that you can do is unfathomable. It's literally global. Innovation is a global game. You can do this. But on the other hand, the people who are making decisions don't always want those things to happen. And so you actually have to be independent somehow. So understanding business's impact and realizing I was a lawyer, I went back to business school. I went back to business school so I can understand how to deal with these people who are making these types of decisions that I couldn't quite understand at the time. In business school, uh, we did a number of things. One of them was formed a business plan contest that now um, uh, does it has a social enterprise element to it. But one of the key arguments in getting that business plan contest approved by, by Harvard at the time was they did not believe that graduates of business school should be entrepreneurs. I'm not kidding. They felt that you needed years of experience before you went and responsibly formed a company. So we were arguing with them about that whole thing. Now, of course, Bill Gates would differ with them, Mark Zuckerberg would differ with them, and we could go on and on. But at the time, those many years ago, because I do have some gray hair, uh, that wasn't an unfounded view. Today, it sounds silly. Uh, so then I went out from, from business school, and I went to um, Silicon Valley to be innovative and everything else, and we did a, did a company called Realtor.com, which is online real estate. And there we partnered with the National Association Association of Realtors. The National Association of Realtors, you have to understand, has a big thing at that, that time in the 90s. They just watched the um, stockbrokers lose their jobs because they got disintermediated with E-Trade, right? They watched the travel agents get disintermediated with Expedia, and they were next. So the, they realized is that they act aggressively, partnered with business, so public-private partnership in a sense, but this way it's an association business relationship, they can protect themselves. Ended up becoming the biggest online real estate uh, uh, company at the time and still today is very big. The bottom line there is that what you learned is that you can do things if you combine forces, but the difference was is that you don't always have an alignment of interest. Because when we had to make a business decision, we were making a business decision. When our partner was involved, the National Association of Realtors, they were making a life and death decision. They don't care about profit because even if they made more profit, if their association was hurt by a decision, they couldn't take it. So you have to have alignment of interest. And so what I started to think about was now all these life experiences experience is how can I actually walk the walk, talk the talk, and make my own mark in the world? Well, Andy Warhol, who's from my hometown, once said something that's very interesting. He said, being good in business is the most fascinating kind of art. Making money is art, and working is art, and good business is the best art. So I always wanted to be an artist. <laughs> and so combining business with social need and understanding what had happened in our, my nonprofit attempt, partnering with the government of the United States and Eastern Europe. Europe, partnering in Silicon Valley, I said that there can be a lot of great change done here. So we decided to form a company called Arava Power Company in the Middle East. And while I was a lawyer, I had done many project finance and energy deals. And I always was fascinated that we were doing all this carbon-based energy and not enough hydro, um, uh, solar, or, or wind deals. And I wanted to do that. And I looked at Israel and I said, that's a, that's a landlocked country in a sense. It's an energy island because it doesn't share energy with its neighbors. There's no, so if they don't produce enough energy, they lose. And their entire economy at that time was uh, carbon-based with coal-fired power plants. So me and a couple of other people, uh, Kibbutz Kitura, Ed Hoffland, and Yosef Bromowitz, we decided we were going to form a company, but we were going to form a company with a mission. So our equation was business plus mission equals success. And the mission was several fold. First, we wanted to make environmental change. So today with the fields that we have built and the impact that we've had, we've now offset more than 4.5 million uh, cubic tons of carbon dioxide. We've also done enough clean energy that we are equivalent of planting 3.1 million trees. 
but we wanted to do more than that. One of the things we wanted to do was do global regional change. And so at the very beginning of the company, because we didn't know what the future would bring, and oftentimes entrepreneurs get diluted down to very little and have little decision rights, think of Steve Jobs getting fired from his own company at one point. We said we have to start from the beginning. So we took a chunk of our equity and we gave it to something called the Arava Environmental Institute. The Arava Environmental Institute is an accredited educational uh, institution in the desert next to it, 25 miles north of Eilat, that teaches environmental sciences. One third of their students are Jewish Israelis. One third of their students are Arabs, meaning Palestinians, Jordanians, and Israeli Arabs. So they're all learning together. And one third of their students come from Europe and the United States. And they have equity now. The third thing that we did was we said we want to also make social change. So we did business with the Bedouin community in Israel and actually partnered with them. The Bedouin community is a community which was a nomadic community, doesn't always have land title rights, but we worked with them to show that the government of Israel, they have title rights so that we can put solar fields in on their land. And we as Israelis, or Americans in my case, um, gaining that trust and sitting by the fire and having tea and building that over months and years was very unique and is very unique. And then the last thing that we did was we said we want to have a spiritual connection and make a practical effect on people's lives. In the Bible, there's something called the law of payah. The law of payah is basically you do not harvest your fields from the corners, and anything you harvest and drop, you don't pick up. And that way, people who are poor can come on your fields at night, get food and eat, and you don't know who you gave to, and nobody's embarrassed. So what we did is we took a look at our fields, and we took the corners of our fields, and we uh, we, we, we gave the profits to non to to, to, um, to many organizations, cancer patients, uh, youths at risk, a number of people. And today we give thousands of dollars every year and it's growing every year because we, we get more solar and more fields um, to all these organizations. Now, there's a lot of lessons here and I'll go through them quickly along this journey. One is you have to have fun or you have to make it fun. We are truly privileged. I tell my kids, we should tell each other and we should remind each other in our worst day, we have the best day of our lives compared to most of the world. And so we have to make sure that we, we, we understand that. We need to know what success means when you start something. When we started Our of Up Power, we knew what our mission was going to be and we made sure that we designed our business to fit that. You have to be a dreamer, but you have to have a realistic plan for execution. Nobody really cares if you're a dreamer and you fail. You only hear about the dreamers who win. It's just the truth. So the world is a harsh place. When that, when that superintendent said, I don't have to accept your computer lab, you have to remember there's a lot of people in the world who don't care about your idealism. Being idealistic is not a vow of poverty. It's a way of life. It's just an approach. You can make money and you can do well by doing good. You should know the golden rule. Those with the gold make the rules. So therefore, <laughs> decide whose gold you're going to take and use. And don't lose sight of what really lasts in the end. It's always quality, it's service, and it's your principles. And finally, profit is not a bad thing. It's just a matter of how you're making that profit and what you do with it. So those are the lessons learned along my journey to be an eccentric philanthropist. I'm not there yet. I'll check in with you in a few years and let you know how it's going. But the bottom line is that you should think about the old adage of the, of the glass that's half empty or half full. Are you a pessimist or optimist? And I would tell you a social entrepreneur always says the glass is half full. But I will also tell you when it's a little bit empty, it's also half full. You can make a change. And by the way, when it's full, it's also half full because it doesn't mean it's sustainable. You have to make it sustainable. At the end, social entrepreneurship means starting from any point and figuring out a way to make business fundamentals work so you can achieve social change. I hope you all help or become a social entrepreneur. Thank you.